So what you have with every communist society or every communist government is incredible corruption because nobody ever holds them. No, they're never being held accountable for their actions. They can do exactly as they want, exactly as they please. So even, even people who get involved in the movement or in the party for noble reasons eventually become corrupted. And so that is what happened. And you saw Venezuela round about from 2003, so around about 2005, every year on, it just went down a little bit more, down a little bit more, down a little bit. There was, uh, I mean, this might strike a chord with uh, something that you may have seen or experienced, particularly coming from North America. Uh, the police said they didn't want to prosecute criminals because that was a symbol of right-wing oppression. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, we have that here. Well, and, in North America. Yeah, in North America. Like, Mexico, not so much. <laughs> yeah, if it happens, it happens. And so what you essentially saw is, left, is, is you saw real problems in society in Venezuela, and then you saw these hard left parties, organizations, figures coming in saying that they can solve these very complex problems which are entrenched in society and will take years to sort out, but applying sort of a magic formula to it, saying communism is what is needed. They come in, the country is bankrupted. It's just done to serve themselves. And they're all, it's a Trojan horse organization. And you see this repeated right the way through. So for instance, when the BLM uh, riots happened in America, and they were marching through the streets saying abolish capitalism. That's when my antenna went off and went, yeah, this, these, these aren't civil rights protesters. I've seen this trick before. You know, fool me, fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice, you know, shame on me. And I just saw that and I go, I know what these people are. And then I saw Patrice Khan's colors doing the Black Power fist salute with Eduardo Maduro, who is the current dictator of Venezuela, you know, and I looked at it and I'm like, I, I know what this is. And I came out and I said it and I got condemned for being racist by people in the comedy industry and, well, you know, all the, all the usual epithets that people say. But I've seen it before. I know what the trick is. Once you've seen the trick, you don't fall for it a second time. Yeah, I mean, what it, it frustrates me now because I mm. see it, but I didn't see it before because I always was a leftist mm. and pretty like like left of left. Like I, mm. you know, when I was younger, I identified as a Marxist. Mm. Um, I went through a phase where I was interested in anarchism, and then I sort of settled into socialism and identifying as a socialist. And what the left does is they kind of just blame capitalism for mm. everything. So it's like, oh, if we just get rid of capitalism, then all of these problems would be magically solved. And that's super oversimplistic and not true. And it, it's really frustrating to me because I have a lot, I mean, I have a lot of experience with the left as mm. a leftist and um, doing kind of lefty journalism and things like that, leftist writing. I've written for a lot of like, or in the past anyway, no longer leftist um, websites and things like that. But also when you're engaging in feminism, which I have for many, many years now, um, they kind of do the same thing, except they add patriarchy. So they're like, just <laughs> smash the patriarchy, abolish capitalism, ta-da. And I started to just, you know, as somebody who was saying things like this, although I think I like to think that I was less simplistic in my approach. I don't think I went around saying smash patriarchy mm -hmm. all the time, but I did say the word patriarchy and capitalism a lot, you know, and started to think, what does this actually mean? Like I'm saying these things, but what, like, what does this mean? And what, what would it mean to abolish capitalism? What would mm -hmm. it mean to smash patriarchy? Like, do we have a plan? Where are we going from here? Like, what's the new system? How do we know that's going to be better? I mean, is there any legitimacy to the idea, which I, I bought into and which, you know, most people who are communists or socialists or Marxists or whatever they want to call themselves, um, you know, on the left, is there any legitimacy to the idea that if we had socialism, there would be more 
equality and there would be less poverty and the working class would be better off. Cause of course that was what I want. You know, like I wasn't a bad person. I thought I was yeah. a good person. Like I wanted things to be better. And that's why I advocated for these systems. Look, and, and, and I think it's very important to say this just cause you know, someone advocates for these things, they may be wrong, but just cause you're wrong, that doesn't make you a bad person. Just because somebody disagrees with me and thinks that socialism is a great way to go, I wouldn't stop being friends with them. Uh, my girlfriend is a socialist. She is very, very left wing. We disagree on practically everything politically, apart from the the fact that Biden's a prick and needs to go. You know, but that's but that's it. But we disagree on everything. So no, not at all. There are aspects of socialism that I fundamentally agree with. Socialized healthcare, essential. I think what happens in America with private healthcare, the fact that the vast majority of we, we were talking on my show to Jimmy Dore and that, that uh, and he was saying that he went bankrupt because he developed a very serious health condition, which wasn't covered by the, um, the insurance company. So he went bankrupt, you know, and he was saying that happens to so many people in America. That's in a country as rich as that. That's an abomination. It's a disgrace. <clears throat> Right, number one. So number two, you know, uh, strong public health system, uh, public health, but also schools, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot to be said for taking some ideas from socialism and placing it in a capitalist model. The problem comes when you see people using the phrase abolish capitalism and they bandy it about. And I, look, I don't blame them. I don't blame them because people can be wrong. We're wrong. It's, you know, it's like when Whoopi Goldberg said that ridiculous thing about, you know, the Holocaust and whatever else, and people jump down her throat saying cancel her. She's wrong. But I, I don't judge people for that. But I would say to people this, and this is a very important question. Have you ever seen capitalism abolished? Because you're advocating for it. Because I'm telling you what I have, and it ain't pretty. And I'll explain to you in one simple story, what it's like when you see capitalism abolished. And for all those people who go, real socialism hasn't been tried, real communism, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to remind you again that all the firebrands of the left came out and supported Chavez. So this was a socialist paradise. This was el paraíso del socialismo. My cousin lived, lives in a very nice part, very middle class part of Caracas called Altamira. Right, very lovely middle class part of Caracas. In a house which was very nice. He went from living in that house then to living in that house now. The main difference is there's blackouts for th electronic electrical blackouts for three to four to five hours at a time. He can no longer drink the water from the tap. It is completely undrinkable. He now drinks water from the tank in the roof above his house. That's how he drinks water. That's what socialism is. And you know it's bad when people climb on the roof of his house to steal the water from the tank. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, so it's it. like obviously what I was just going to say, it obviously isn't helping the, no. the lower classes because – you know, those are the people who would be trying to steal water. I mean, you don't have access to clean water. That's almost the worst of the worst. Like having access to clean water, food, shelter are kind of the, the basic things. Yeah, of course. Of course they are. So these people banding about these slogans who have grown up in the West, I say to people, and then people go, hey, you've got privilege. I'm like, look, we've all got different forms of privilege, number one, right? Okay. Number two, I say to them, you've got Western privilege. Yeah. You know, what do you mean? I go, you don't know what it's like to see society collapse. You don't know what it's like to see society unravel before your eyes. You have no idea what it's like to flee for your life from a country where things have completely gone to pot. You don't know what it's like when a government comes into power and goes, you know what? You've said this. You're going to get put in prison. My cousin is a journalist. He had to flee Venezuela for his life because Chavez's goons were targeting him because he was critical of the government. In Venezuela, they have a thing a secret, called the secret police called El, Salvi, El Sabin. And what they do 
is if you are critical of the government, if you are making a nuisance of yourself, if you are criticizing them overtly, they will turn up at your flat in the early hours of the morning They in ski moss. They will take you away and they will put you in a prison called La Tumba, which is what it sounds. And they will throw you in there and you may come out or you may not, but you will be there for months. That is what happens to people who disagree with them. There is a very, very well known in Venezuela comedian who had to leave called Iran Aristagueta. He used to have an improv group. They weren't allowed to do jokes about the government. They were doing improv in a bar in Caracas and they started to be successful and people started to come down, really enjoy it because they were in the first improv groups in Caracas. They did a few jokes about the government. The bar owner, quite rightly, went up to them and went, shows off, they're done. Because if you do that, they're going to get come after you, they're going to come after me, they're going to come after my family, and you're going to destroy my business. I mean, it's so interesting because that situation is what people in Canada are advocating for in many ways. Not all people, but Americans too, you know. I don't know if you can hear it. Can you hear the hammer? Yeah, I can. There? <laughs> they had stopped that whole time, and then as soon as I started talking, they're like, I'm just going to yeah. bang on something else yeah. again. A woman is talking. We must <laughs> shut that up, Manuel. <laughs> exactly. Misogyny, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Institutionalized misogyny in my home. Um, I mean, that is pretty much <laughs> Latin America. <laughs> yeah, there are there are a few problems here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Just a couple. Um, but, you know, like... I don't know if they realize that they're doing it, but I know people will think I'm crazy if I say this, but again, like part of the reason that I left Canada is because I was like, <clears throat> I'm going to end up in jail. Like I mm. say things that are critical of government policy and these, these bills that the liberal government, Justin Trudeau's government, that they're trying to push through are bills to, you know, deal with hate speech online. But of course, hate speech is just disagreeing with government policies. If you, if, mm. you know, when it comes down to it, it would be like disagreeing with gender identity ideology, for example, like mm. referring to males who identify as trans women as he, which are things that I do and I don't do to be antagonistic, but I do because I think that this is an ideology that's harmful to women mm. and, and children in particular, but I think it's harmful in general just to, you know, lie and force people to lie or, you know, compel them to, to refer to men as she when, when they're men, obviously. But, you know, like, I don't want to live in a country where it's criminal to disagree with ideology and people frame it as hate and hate speech and dangerous. And therefore it's okay to criminalize because hate's bad and they don't see the manipulation that's happening and they seem to, you know, not be aware that this can happen to them. Like Canadians, I think, believe that they're so safe. Um, be I mean, they are privileged. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a good country to live in, you know, healthcare in Canada is good. I really appreciate that. Like we have decent education. It's beautiful, you know? Um, <clears throat> but I think that because of that privilege and because of that experience, I think that they're safe from dictatorships or from, you know, persecution, um, from things going bad. And that means that they've started to support policies that I think are quite dangerous. Look, it's partly it's not their fault. They've never experienced these type of societies. They don't understand how lucky they are. And as a result, they want, they, the, you know, they demand this because here's the thing. To me, this is safetyism. This is what this is. You know, in the West, we want to feel safe. We want to feel safe and we want to feel protected. How do we feel safe? We feel safe because we're, we don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable. How are we made to feel uncomfortable? We're put in a situation where we don't feel in control, right? So you see it all the time where people going to a comedy club, getting upset because somebody says something they dislike. They feel it because, you know, they have an argument with someone. You know, you see it all the time in university campuses. This is a safe space. What does that actually mean? It means that there's some that everybody who I'm surrounded by won't disagree with me. And that's how that's how they control people. 
That's how you control people. So people who actually are, disag are disagreeing with you, people who actually confront you, people who have opinions that differ to yours, they say to you, no, you're making people feel unsafe. We're here to keep people safe. Therefore, we can't have this type of speech. Therefore, we can't have these type of views. You're making people feel unsafe. You're not making people feel unsafe. What you're doing is challenging people, and they don't want it. And the problem is, is that we're going further and further down the path. So at the start of it, I'll give you an example. We had Brendan O'Neill, the former editor of Spiked on the show, Free Speech Absolutist. He came on the show, mm -hmm. and he said there's a problem with free speech. And this was in 2018. I was like, really, Brendan? He was like, yes. And I, sa and I said, give me an example. And he gave me the example of a comedian who wasn't allowed to do a Holocaust-denying song. Right? And I said to him, Brendan, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, mate. I'm struggling to give a fuck about this. Right? And, but he made the point to me, went, yes, I know what you're saying. But if you're not prepared to dis defend free speech for the views that you find despicable, eventually they're going to come for you. And this is what people don't understand in Canada and wherever else. Like people may disagree with you, with your views on, on the trans issue, but they don't understand that eventually it's going to move to something else. Once they've kicked you out, once you're no longer acceptable in the Overton window, it's then going to be something else. For mm -hmm. instance, I know this comedian, and he's very woke, and he's got all the right opinions, and he's doing really well. And, you know, and he, he had a little bit of a set to with me on Twitter and whatever else. I saw him at a gig. And, he, we were and we started talking, and he was talking to me about vaccines, and he whispered to me, basically, he looked around and said, I haven't taken the vaccine because somebody I know has had a seizure from it. They had a really bad reaction. I don't want to take it. I also know other people have had back bad reactions. Do you think he's going to tell his woke mates about that? No, because he's now an anti-vaxxer, and now he's beyond the pale, even though... He's got quite reasonable reservations for not taking the vaccine. But he's now an anti-vaxxer, and now he's going to be kicked out from the tribe if he admits to his position.